Happy New Year and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, episode 23, the second semester. Coming to you from Hamilton, I'm Sean and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We're here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers. Each week, we hope to highlight some of that feedback, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. And if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Now I'm guessing it's probably because it's the middle of the holidays, everyone's off work, and no one's really on social media. Well, they're on and off, but mainly just sharing pictures of the awesome stuff they got or the amazing food they've eaten. But we didn't get much feedback over the, since the last episode, which is cool. I'm perfectly good with that. Now, I did have one rather amusing exchange. Um, I think it was on Facebook with Patreon backer Joe Swick. So, yeah, it was on Facebook. He sent me a note. Um, they basically said, we just played our first game of Azul. It was great. Thanks for the recommendation. And I'm like, I wrote back. I'm like, oh, cool. I'm glad you liked it. Uh, most people do seem to like it. And, you know, I'm glad the recommendation paid out. Then, like, I don't know, about six hours later, I was, I tended, I tried to post one picture, one gaming picture a day on Instagram, just so that there's something to see on that account and keep it growing. Uh, and I posted a picture of a game of Azul I played. Particularly one I did absolutely horrible at with a caption, something like I seem to be getting worse at this game instead of better. And then like two minutes later, Joe comments on it. And I had to laugh at this. It's, I just realized your Azul is completely different from mine. And then like two minutes later, he replied again. Ah, aha, we have Azul stained glass of Sintra. I like I, I literally laughed out loud. I'm like, oh, my God. So now we have the official word from Joe that stained glass of Sintra is really good. And if you recommend Azul, picking up stained glass is not a bad option. I now I know it's on my holiday wish list. It didn't show up under the tree, but I do have a birthday coming up. So there's still a chance. We've mentioned a few times that uh, the Sintra game is hot this year. So it's good to hear the recommendations from someone within the Bellhop family. Another patron, Brian Kurtz, shared a pic of his family playing Out Fox with this caption. Hey, Tabletop Bellhop, <laughs> thanks for the suggestion of Outfoxed, a huge hit with the whole family. That's awesome to hear, Brian. I, at least in this case, there's no second new version of Outfoxed. So when I recommend Outfoxed, there's no chance you're going to have to go pick and pick up the wrong version. Again, not that Sintra is wrong. It's supposedly just as good. Though I got to admit, it would be really cool to see Outfox 2. Because my kids really dig that game, but over the last two years that they've owned it, they've kind of figured it's a deduction game, and they've kind of figured out how to solve it right every time. They don't tend to fail anymore, so it'd be really cool to see like a next step to outfoxed. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the Bellhops tabletop? Every week, I like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and other cool stuff that's been going on gaming-wise. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com. So for me, I only got in two games this past week. Now, again, that seems really weird to say. We go back to that nonlinear podcasting. We do our Week in Review Monday to Monday with um, New Year's hitting on Monday. I played a heck of a lot of games, but that was on Monday. Before Monday, though, the week previous going Monday to Monday, there were only two, but they were really good games, and that's Gloomhaven and Sagrada. It's big, it's heavy, and it's back, folks. It's Gloomhaven. And yes, it's heavy. It's back there. I carried it upstairs, and I'm like, man, I forgot how heavy this is. So for those of you following along, yes, that is two weeks in a row for Gloomhaven, and I'm really hoping to make it three this Friday. And after a big win last week that was rather on rather hard on a rather hard side quest um where we I, I talked about it last week where we opened a package that maybe i think might have been better saved for later but we were we were riding a high we we felt like we accomplished something we also felt that it was work accomplishing that and we needed a break so we decided to move back towards the main plot the interesting thing though is this took some work deciding what to do 
and led us to one of the minor problems with the game. We couldn't remember where the main plot was. And this is such an odd problem because you would think that as you were marking the map, the stickers would have a difference between primary and secondary adventures. No, not at all. So when you play and you finish a quest, you'll often put, I found where we are in the plot, multiple stickers on the board, not just one. It's not just, yes, the first module, it, it starts off very linear. You go here to here, and I think it might branch into two. But like after that, like there was at least one mission we did where we unlocked three stickers. So you put the stickers out, and at the time, it's telling you interesting stuff. Like, you found a map in the treasure chest, and it just says this. So obviously, side quest. Then you've got the other one that's like, follow the bad guys to their base. Obviously, main quest. Then you've got, what are the bad guys dropped this note oh sort of side quest um, or possibly main quest right like tied into the main plot not just the random treasure map you found and when you're doing that you're just like okay cool and then you sit down and you're like okay let's go here next and then you do the next mission it kind of branches again and you do it again and then you come back because you didn't play for a month and a half and you sit down and you look at all the stickers on the map and that's how you start each session is you sit down you get your group together you hand out all the stuff you set you set you don't even set up the map at this point really um and you look at the map and pick a spot to explore and then you find that chapter in the book like the thing is that much later like i'm trying to remember that first quest branch into two ones follow the the bad guy the other ones explore the gloom, it was technically what it said. And we're like, oh, we have a clue for the gloom and it's Gloomhaven. That sounds neat. But like, that's all we could actually remember. And we're like, well, which quest was which? And it, here's where you get into a divide between tabletop RPG, video games, and board games. In an RPG, players wouldn't know that they're supposed to take notes and keep track of what an NPC said to them. In a video game, mm -hmm. you'd get cutscenes or reminders from an NPC who just repeat the same information over and over again. <laughs> but in a board yes. game, it's not designed to clearly, or if it's not designed to clearly indicate and explicitly tell the players to make notes and doesn't differentiate, uh, it seems like a design flaw. I'm not sure. Not a major one, but. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, as I said, it's it's like a minor problem. Like it's, it's, it's definitely an issue. Like the other thing too, is you, you can't pick the wrong answer. Like, just because we didn't remember where the main plot was, we still could have picked anything on the map and kept playing. It's not like the game halted and we were stuck at a at a dead end. We we just could have just picked this spot and go, eh, that one looks interesting. And then once we got there, went, oh, yeah, yeah, that ties back to this. So I kind of get it. The video game thing makes me laugh, though, because we booted up an old classic game. I guess I'm going off rails again tonight. Uh, we booted up an old classic PlayStation 3 game the other day, something NG Games is playing, whose name I cannot pronounce, so I'm not even going to try. Really cool game. And we jumped in and I'm like, oh man, are we even going to remember what's happening? And sure enough, as soon as you boot it up, a thing shows up at the top of the screen and it's like, go and investigate Ding Dong Well. And then we walked into the town and every person we talked to is like, oh, the king's still missing. Have you found the king? Have you checked the well yet? And we're like, oh, I guess we don't have to worry about trying to remember where to go. Well, in Gloomhaven, we kind of did that ourselves. So what I did is I grabbed the, the big spiral book and I went back to quest one and I read out the, the completion section. I forget what it's called, but whatever. When you finish the quest and I'm like, okay, well, number 11 was this. Did we do that? Yeah, we did that. Okay. And number nine is this. Okay. So that's the way we can go to do that. Okay. And then, so I, and then I go to number nine. I'm like, remember when we were at number nine, they said this. And like, this probably took half an hour to go back through the book to reacquaint ourselves with the map. Like it worked, but I, I'm thinking next time we get to start taking notes and like sean said that's something you expect right when you play an rpg you probably expect you're either playing you either expect to play every week and remember everything or in most cases someone if it's not just the dm or one of the players actually the way we used to do is we'd elect a player to take notes would recap everything and actually when i ran rpgs but here, here's an rpg tip of the night um every week have one of the players the next week give you a recap of the session that happened before and i used to give in-game rewards for that so in dnd fourth ed i had a way to get rewards and uh xp for doing this so and then the next week someone different had to give the recap and because there was an incentive there all the players took notes because they never knew if they were going to be the one that has to do the recap and it was a cool role-playing moment because i had the players do the recap in character so it was what that character remembered happened last week not what that player did but anyway i i think we got to start doing that with Gloom haven like we have character sheets we, you know we grab a notepad we just got to put some notes down that like oh yeah we want to late return to this later or next check out this or main plot go here or here 
Yeah, it, it seems like the designers waffled a bit and couldn't just make up their mind on some aspects, whether it was a board game or an RPG. So after our I have flashback of me reading the rule books. We decided to go back to one of the lower number quests, one of the ones that literally branched off from like part two or three. It was really early in the game. Uh, we jumped in pretty quick because we didn't have a month without playing. We already knew our characters. I was the only one that leveled up, so I was the only one that had a new card. Uh, and we didn't have any rules to relearn or rules to remember, especially after, like I said, the last one was very puzzly. This was much more... Just play. Just bash the bad guys, open the doors, explore. And this this is where uh, continuation of play can make a big deal in all your games. Familiarity with the game, whether playing or teaching, really means a lot on how a game night will flow. Yeah, I agree. Uh, definitely there's, there's something to be said for meeting every week or every two weeks. Now, except for getting our butts handed to us in the front first room, like, oh, man, we were worried. We're like, after this front room, like, I don't know if we're going to be able to finish this. Uh, there were some lucky draws. There were some bad guys in there that had abilities that could hit everyone at once instead, like, hit up the three people. And they went first. They got better initiative, basically. Uh, we did really well otherwise. So much so that at the end, we were actually killing some turns just to get some extra treasure and XP. So again, it's not at all easy as a four-player game, but it seems like the group is really working out the party dynamics, and that's helping things move along nicely. I agree, though I do have to say this was very different experience as our last game. Like, this I wouldn't say is, it almost reaches easy. This wasn't hard. This wasn't also wasn't as tight, which is interesting because this was at a higher level because we finally hit the point where our average party level is higher than two, and so when we play at on easy, we play at level one, and which is kind of my fault because the last game I leveled to level three before everyone else after a city mission. Now, at the end of this mission, two more party members hit level three, so it's going to be level one or two the next mission as well. So you've really jumped ahead of the main track experience requirements, or...? I, I'm not sure. So just overall, it was striking how different this felt versus that side quest the very puzzly very hard side quest and excuse me i can't help but wonder if this is due to the fact that the main plot was written by the designer or his design team right it has his name on it it came in the box when you bought the game whereas these bonus quests like the one we did were actually added as kickstarter backer rewards so people backed at a certain level got to design scenarios. Now, I don't know how much the designer was involved. I doubt it was just the fan design the scenario. They sent it in. They threw it in the book. I'm sure there was playtesting and stuff. But I'm thinking that it seems like these backer reward quests are more involved, more detailed, more difficult, more puzzly. And it makes me think that we may want to take our time before trying other bonus content. Yes, it's all in the main book, but I'm calling it bonus content. And you can tell because it says uh, designed by, like there's a little byline for all these, and it's all the, the side quests that you can randomly unlock. It's not main plots at all. It's sad that they've let content enter the game that's out of sync with the rest of the game. It's great to get backer contributions, and Admirable even to offer such a great um, bonus, but you shouldn't step back to the point where it makes the game wholly different, and it, it seems like there's a lack of editorial control that may have gotten things a little, just a, a hair out of balance and, and given it a, that different feel. Yeah, agreed. It, it does feel very different. Now, the fact that the bonus content is harder kind of also fits RPGs. I mainly think of Final Fantasy here, right? You can go through and beat Final Fantasy and beat up Sephiroth at the end. And it, it's hard enough, and you have to grind, you have to do it. But then there's the whole other side quest thing where you can raise the different chocobos. And I, I don't even remember. You can get the meteor spell. And there's like a different side boss that is way harder than the end boss of the actual game. And that's kind of what this reminds me of, is here's these bonus quests, but man, they're hard. And if you do them, like the reward we got was significant. It's it's a good reward. It was worth doing the quest. Again, I don't want to spoil anything, right? We're talking a legacy game here. But we got something good for doing it. And it was hard and it felt rewarding getting that thing. So in a way, it's like, I, I, I get it. But it does make me think when we're picking quests, we ha it have to be cognizant of it. Do we want to continue the main plot, which feels nice and balanced and doable, Though not easy, but we, you know, you got to put your thinking hats on. You do have to cooperate. Or do we want to try to solve a really hard puzzle for a good reward? 
So ongoing, um, my ongoing thoughts, uh, what I've thought about the game. I've been doing this all along. You guys basically get the whole uh, Moe's journey through Gloomhaven if you listen to all of our episodes. What I'm starting to really enjoy in the game is very much an RPG aspect, which is the ongoing character development. I am playing the Savas Craighart, who I've named Burke. I'm really enjoying how my perception of this character has changed from a board game piece, from a sheet of paper and a miniature, and some stats that everyone who plays the Savas Craighart's going to have when they first start playing, to what has become my Savas Craighart that I leveled up, that whose check marks I've spent, whose deck I've modified, whose cards I've chosen, and whose playstyle I've adopted and adapted. Now, the other big part of this, besides the mechanical changes, have been the personal goals we get. So there, there is a personal goal when you retire the character. That really hasn't come into play much. But every mission, you draw two of these objective cards, and you pick one of them. And if you complete it during the battle, you get a check mark. Now, a lot of these are not going to further the goals of the party. And just based on the ones I've gotten, it's adapted how I played the character and has given the character personality. Like, he loves br busting open doors when he probably shouldn't, because in two different games, I got a thing that was, if you're the first one to open the first door, you get a check mark. But I've made that part of the character now. So even if I don't get that card, I'm going to be tempted to bust open a door. The other thing is how we do the encounter. So every time you have a traveler city encounter, the group as a whole has to make a decision. And the more we play, the more, more of those are becoming role-playing decisions instead of med game decisions. It's... Yeah, well, remember when we fought these guys earlier and they pissed us off and this guy's of the same race, so screw them. Or I, we've definitely developed characters because of it and how we've played our characters. And there is definitely role playing going on. Like we're not full on D&D. &D, we're not really having in character discussions. But then when those cards come up, we definitely reference back past events we do like to talk about the fact that one of the characters um brought a cat with her and carried her through battle during one thing because it was cute stuff like that so looking at my craig heart not yours mine he doesn't get or understand money or the party's fascination with collecting it especially if there's bad guys around he digs natural things like stone trees and dirt more than these living being things like fleshy bits He's got a strong and growing affinity with the Earth and can now not only create but destroy using Earth elements. Using nature against his enemies is his favorite tactic when he's not sitting back, hitting multiple enemies with ranged attacks. Why hit one enemy when well, you can hit many? Or, even better, if you can befuddle or immobilize them at the same time. Building, changing, and destroying battlefield obstacles is a point of personal joy. And, well, when I get bored, I break things. I smash things because that character gets XP for destroying objects. And when there's nothing else to do, I'm going to put my head through a tree or smash a table. It's interesting, as I expect that many players of this game, uh, the hardcore hobby board game uh, type, without the lover experience in RPGs, have a notably different experience playing this game than you and your party do. Not better or worse, but different as you remove yourself from the character more if you don't have that natural RPG uh, just flow. Yeah, I, I agree. Though I wonder how many people without RPG experience develop it through Gloomhaven. Like, I think it's kind of a natural thing. Like, you're going to get attached to your character. Your play style is going to get modified. Just... The way you level up in the game is you have a deck of cards with all, all your abilities. And when you level up, you get to add one new card to your deck. But then when you go into a battle, you're only allowed to bring the same number of cards you could at first level. And modifying that deck to fit the scenario you're about to do is a big part of the game. But just by picking those cards, you're making that character unique. And then there's the whole check system, which lets you change your modifier deck. And again, one person playing is going to go in and remove all the zero effects so that they're always doing really good or really bad. Whereas someone else is going to go in and put in as many plus effects as possible. And then someone else could go in and play the same character and worry all about elemental effects. So no matter even if you're just playing it as a board game, you are modifying the character and making it your own. Whether that turns into role playing. 
there's definitely character development either way. Up next, we have Sagrada. Uh, this I played at Breakout Con. So this is not, it's technically off my shelf of shame, but it's not a new to me game. Breakout Con is in Toronto and they had a massive game library. It uh, was provided by the TABS, Toronto Area Board Gamers, TABS, T T Toronto Area Board Gaming Society, T-A-B-S. Uh, fantastic large group. Like it's it's the WGR times 10 or times 100, right? Toronto's a metropolis, Windsor's a small city. Uh, so lots of gamers, huge. Like this is the biggest game library I've ever seen at a con. I think it might've been bigger than Origins. It was close, if not. And this is a small con, like the breakout, we talk about it, it's, it's no Gen Con, it's not even close to Origins. It was probably bigger than Queen City Conquest, but it's around the same level. I don't know numbers, sorry, but not a big con, but they have a significant amount of games based on the number of people there. Now, similar to when we talked about QCC, Queen City Conquest, they have a play and win section. And we played Sagrada in hopes of winning, because I had heard really good things about it. We didn't win. Um, and and she games and I are the ones that played it. We enjoyed it, but it I didn't leave going, I gotta buy this game. Like it it's good, but I don't need to own it. It's all right. Now I got a copy from my in-laws for Christmas, and I gotta admit I'm happy about that. I'm really happy about that. Because I gotta say that if you're it's a little late for Christmas shopping, but one of the tips for uh, if you're trying if people are asking you what you want or you want a wish list or you're trying to buy for someone and you're listening into what they have to say, I gotta say games you kind of want but aren't sure are you want to spend your your gaming budget on make perfect gifts like i think that's a, that's like the awesome like that's what i put on my wish list are the games that games i wouldn't spend money money on but i wouldn't be unhappy owning friday after gloomhaven i cracked the shrink wrap on my copy and the four of us played and we had a great time you know this is a beautiful game um yeah. from the box would put you in the mind of azul or, or sintra even more so but aside from the pattern, build, pattern building and pretty colors, this is a notably different game. Agreed. Agreed. I'll get a little more into that later. I want to end with a comparison of the two because it's you can't not compare these two games. Absolutely. So Sagrada is a dice drafting game. You're drafting dice to put on a 4 by 4 grid. Amazing inset player board. Nice and thick. The dice aren't going to move. Thank you. Even better than Azul that way. Um, so you're putting dice into this 4 by 4 grid trying to build a stained glass window following very specific placement rules. Uh, this time, again, it looks like Azul. You're, instead of building a tile pattern, you're building a stained glass window pattern that's still a grid with stuff in it. It's an interesting trend right now that we uh, have a lot of games that are, without sacrificing gameplay, just adding a pleasant, artistic, beautiful flair. Yeah, game overall game production has rised up quite a bit like i actually wonder if kickstarter is to blame for that some of these huge projects where they're able to throw in the prettiness and then the companies who uh like i i swear this is part of why mayfair games is gone because mayfair still to this day was putting out games with cubes and like no one wants cubes anymore i i should correct that there are, is a certain subset of euro gamers that hate plastic and miss the wooden cubes but in general you're going to want nice thick tiles, colors, uh, things with stickers on them, screen printing, you things just look better. Uh, it's definitely a trend. It's a good, in, in my opinion, a positive. So jumping back to Sagrada, there are five colors of standard D6, six-sided dice. Um, the pips on the dice represent the tint of the color. So one is light and six is dark. All theme doesn't actually matter, but I thought it was an interesting way to tie in the numbers on the dice to the theme. At the start of the game, players pick from a hand of patterns. So you're going to have four to choose from, and these patterns slide into your player board, and they limit where the dice can go. So some squares are going to need a certain color. Other squares are going to need a certain tint. Now, when playing, the most important rule is no two dice with the same number or same color can go directly adjacent. And that's pretty much it. It's not hard rules, and it's not hard to learn, and it's not hard to teach. We seem to be saying it every week. Uh, simple <laughs> games and simple rules forming complex relationships to build that strong gameplay. Agreed. So here's where Sagrada uh, gets interesting. So every player gets a personal scorecard. 
And I don't mean a scorecard like where you track it. It's a, a scoring card, a card that tells you how to score. And it's just going to be one of the five colors of dice. And what that means is at the end of the game, whatever your color is, you're going to add up all the numbers on the dice you placed of that color and add them up. So that's some of your base points. Now, the other thing is the three public scoring cards, and these come over a deck, and I didn't count how many there are, but there's a significant number of these, and they change every game. So you're going to put out three, and this is how everyone is going to score. So one game, it could be uh, you're going to get points for having rows of different shades. The next game, it might be similar colors diagonally adjacent. And the next game, it might be sets of ones and twos, or it could be all three of those together. And what's cool is every time you play, how you score is different. And I think this is a great feature that makes it harder for people to become experts yeah. as the game will be slightly different than the last time. Every time you play, in how what you have to score, so you can't develop that mm -hmm. perfect strategy. Agreed. Uh, then there's one more twist, too. So the other set of deck of cards, you guys, you're going to shuffle these and put them out. These are tools. Again, tying to the theme, right? These are the tools you're using to work on your window. Uh, these cards let you break the rules. So they'll let you do things like re-roll the dice in the dice pool before drafting. Or normally you take one turn and it snakes around the table. Everyone picks a die and then it backwards snakes back, like when you set up cities in Catan. Uh, there's, there's a tool that lets you take both your dice right away. Um, there's another one that lets you move your dice on your player board as long as they still fit the, the, player, the placement restrictions. And the interesting part is to use a tool, you have to pay for it. And you get the glass beads. I don't know what they're supposed to be in the game, money, whatever. Um, and the amount of glass beads you get is based on how hard a pattern you pick at the beginning. So at the beginning, when you're picking one of four patterns, your patterns are rated on a difficulty of three to six. The more difficult your pattern, the more tokens you get to spend on tools. Now, the other trick to tools is the first person to use a tool gets to do a cheat for only one token, but everyone who uses after that has to pay two tokens. So if you took a really easy pattern and you only got three tokens, you're probably only going to get to activate two tools the entire game. It's a great help in balancing some of the randomness uh, with the cost uh, applied to it. Yeah, and it adds a good push your luck element, right? Like, do you try the six and try to not use too many of the tools? Or you're like, man, I don't want to have to worry too much about placement patterns. And the other thing we've noted is different patterns fit the scoring better. So the first time we played Enchi Games had a pattern that had a bunch of diagonal colors on it that were the same. And while one of the scoring requirements was diagonal colors that were the same. So for her, she's like, yeah, I'm going to take the six difficulty because, well, it matches one of the scoring cards in play. So if I can just follow one, I'll score both. Makes sense. So I said it earlier, Sean kind of mentioned it. You can't help but compare this game to Azul. You are drafting square things and putting them on a square grid trying to make a pattern. That's the, they're both games are identical as far as that is concerned. How you draft is different and where you place is different, but the, the meat of the game, picking one thing up from a central pool and putting it in front of you and the type of thinking required where you're not only looking at your board, you're looking at what other people are doing as well is very similar. What I've got to say is Sagrada has significantly more meat to it. There's a lot more to think about and a lot more pre-planning required. But at the same time, there's also a higher random element as you aren't pulling dice from, you, you aren't only pulling things from a bag. You are rolling the dice. So what's up each turn is much more variable than Azul when there's only, what is it, five different tiles. Uh, the other thing that's way more variable is, as Sean mentioned, because you've got patterns, tools, and scorecards that are all randomized, I don't think you could, you could two games of Sagrada are never going to be the same. Like the odds of all four players picking the exact same patterns, the same three tools coming up, the same personal scoring cards coming up, and the same three scoring cards coming up is probably close to winning the lottery. Like it's going to be hard to, to have it recreated. So no two games are ever going to be the same. Also, there's more, way more to think about. Like there, it's way harder to place your tiles or your dice in Sagrada than to place your tiles in Azul. And there's way more to think about. So AP happens, analysis paralysis. There is more thinking time, which leads to a significantly longer game. Now, I say significantly longer, but it's still very easy to teach, very accessible, and overall, very fast. Like, this is no heavy Euro, 
This is still a family weight abstract, just like Azul, but when comparing the two games directly, Sagrada just is longer, heavier, and, and thinkier. Now, a lot of the, the gaming purists uh, on BGG particularly are noting that the randomness is problematic in the game. There's too much of it. Um, and a lot of uh, solutions for that are being tossed around, or at least ways to just sort of balance the randomness. Um, they talk about uh, how many dice are there for smaller player counts. Uh, and apparently a, that's actually addressed in the rule book for the five to six player expansion and will be coming okay. to future printings of the game. So they're actually removing dice for smaller uh, player counts. See, I was thinking about that. I, I haven't played the game a lot. On New Year's Eve, I played two three player games and it did feel different because one of the differences when you play full player count, there's 90 dice in this game. All 90 dice get placed. Well, if they can, or they get removed from the game. All 90 dice are going to come out. When you play with less players, certain dice are not going to come out, which does then weight colors. Like you could have less green this game or more red, which is not something that happens in a full game. In a full game, it's always perfectly balanced. As for randomness, I don't know. Like I can't see it being too random. Yes, you're rolling the dice, but there are ways to mitigate it with the tools. But not only that, every player is affected by it the same. It's not like one player is subject to randomness. All four of you are dealing with the same randomness. But that is definitely a difference from Sagrada and Azul. Azul, the only randomness is the th when the tiles come out and where they get placed on the market, which is random, but you're nev almost never stuck with no option. It's pick here or here. And yeah, okay, I didn't get three reds together, but I can pick the two reds and a one red later, where this is more likely to the dice get rolled and literally you can't place any of them without using a tool. So I, I can see the complaint somewhat, but I don't I don't think it's a detraction from the game. I think it's more of a feature. Well, there's a certain type of gamer out there who really tries to minimize the randomness in their games. And, and I think that's probably the, the loudest voices out there. I could see that, though I got to say, if you hate randomness that much, why are you buying a dice game? So a lot of people are going to wonder which is better and which they should buy. I personally think now owning both, there is room for both. Back when I first played Sagrada, I was perfectly happy with my copy of Azul, and I could take or leave Sagrada. Now having played it more, I like it more than I did when I played it at Breakout Kind. Azul is still the ultimate pick up and play, teach in five minutes, um, appeals to pretty much everyone I've ever taught to, everyone likes it. Uh, it's, it's almost a must own. The increased difficulty thinking and planning required for Sagrada is going to make it appeal to more to some gamers, and it's also going to turn some off. Um, I can think of uh, what we were playing with Tori and Kat, and they were talking about possibly getting it for their mom. And at first when we brought it out and started playing, like, yeah, we're buying this for mom. By the time we got halfway in and the placements got much harder because your board's more filled and there was more take that, they're like, huh, maybe not for mom, right? It's not going to appeal to everyone. Whereas I see no problem like everyone loves azul i i admit there's people out there that don't but in general most majority of people think azul you're not it's not as universally going to be as universally loved the other thing is i have no problem bringing azul everywhere it's a date night game we have played it at coffee shops uh at bars on bar tables um I'm not going to do that with Sagrada. As I mentioned, it has 90 small, shiny, pretty D6s. And if I lose one, I can't play the game at four-player anymore. Um, this is not something I'm going to bring to a pub where I would happily bring and play Azul. Yeah, you got to keep track of a lot of pretty dice. But at the same time, those dice will attract some nice attention at your local FLGS on game nights. That's true. See, I, I think part of this is speaking from personal experience, too, because... Uh, not my personal experience, something I witnessed is a local gamer brought a copy of Sagrada to the game store and lost a yellow D6 oh. and no longer can play their copy of Sagrada. Now he did contact the company and they were cool enough to send him a copy. And yes, he was honest. He didn't say, hey, my copy didn't come with it. He said, hey, I was at a gaming event and I lost one. And they sent him a replacement die. Cool enough. But I have seen it actually happen. So it, I think that's part of it is whenever I think about, I'm like, well, I haven't, there haven't been a lot of game nights since I've owned Sagrada, but when I think about bringing Sagrada to the game store, I'd see Ross's face, or actually I see Ross crawling around on the floor trying to find a yellow D6 after game night ends. And I, I think, huh, maybe I'll save this for home. 
I wonder if uh, cons will start having Sagrada booths where you can buy uh, replacement dice. <laughs> Just replacement dice, yeah. To, to be honest, uh, the top of my head, it's it's not a game company that I know well, so I don't remember who makes it. It's not one of the big, it's not like Fantasy Flight, yeah, Asmodee, somewhere where I would know what booth to go, but it wouldn't surprise me. That was what hit the bellhops tabletop, but I happen to know that Sean got in some gaming this past week as well. So what games hit Sean's tabletop? Well, since I am part of the Tabletop Bellhop team, I really do feel like I wasn't holding up my end of the gaming. So, in the new year, I'm looking to change that. Uh, more than just regular visits to the Bellhop tables, Christmas was the perfect place to start. Uh, and the kids were interested in games of their own, so we tried a couple of levels of games to see where in the hobby they were interested. I like that. I like that you're, you didn't just, like... I'm going to pick the game I like, or I'm going to go super easy kids game. He actually like balanced it by picking up a couple different ones so that uh, we actually kind of get to this later in the episode uh, on, on finding a basis of finding a common ground on, on where to start. So what did you start with? Well, the first thing the kids actually reached out to us and uh, part of the, uh, the Santa wish was a, a popular game, which was clue Harry Potter edition from US USAopoly. Uh, the game was specifically requested by them, and it's Clue. It's, it's pretty hard to go wrong with Clue. Uh, we've actually played uh, other versions of Clue, Simpsons Clue, in fact, uh, at uh, some relative's house. So they knew the game, and they knew they liked the uh, the fun of it. And, well, they're huge Harry Potter, Potter fans, let's, just, let's be honest. So we opened the box, and right away, things are different. Um, but in a really good way. It is a beautiful board. They have really uh, gone with the Marauder's Map concept. Uh, some people complain that it's a little hard to read the text on the names of the rooms, but you can't deny that it looks gorgeous. And then on top of that, they've actually added a mechanic underneath the board where you are changing Hogwarts every turn. So cool. secret passages open, doors open and close. Every turn, the board itself is actually changing. Uh, which really, you know, makes it feel that much more like Hogwarts and, and captures uh, the feeling along with the official license using movie and uh, images and graphics uh, that are licensed. That is awesome to hear, because I just assume, like, the Monopolies, every Monopoly variant that comes out is still Monopoly. Like, I went out and bought the Star Wars Monopoly because I'm a huge Star Wars fan. It, it actually, I think it's like the Episode 1 one, so it shows how much of a Star Wars fan if I bought anything marked as Episode 1. And I just expected something Star Wars about it instead of the chance cards just being called Force cards. And, like, it still said Jail. Like, what, it, yep. it's the same game. It's just a new board, right? And I honestly, I, I don't play a lot of licensed games because thankfully my kids aren't too obsessed with too many licenses. Though it is great to hook them on... Oh, we talked about that when we were talking about shopping for kids, right? Yep. That one of the best things you can do is find that thing they're excited about, right? And buy a game in that market. Um, but it, it's cool to know that Clue has messed with it. I just assume it was all the same. Now, again, going back to Star Wars, there is a Star Wars Clue I've been so tempted by because the board is part of the Death Star. And it looks fantastic. But then anytime I share a deal on it with tabletop deals, people are like, oh, God, it's terrible. So I stayed away. But it's cool to know that Clue isn't... When you buy Clue, you're not just getting Clue. You yep. are getting something potentially better. Now, there is another version out there, and there's there's some confusion in listings, and it's actually a tricky one, but it does seem to be out of print, uh, and it's Clue World of Harry Potter. Uh, and it okay. is more of a classic Clue. It's It doesn't seem to have anything different, but I am because it's out of print, I'm having trouble. I was having trouble figuring out exactly what there was uh so unfortunately once you've opened the game and you've seen how beautiful it is and you've you've mm -hmm. built this little feature it goes south pretty fast um so the changing of the school is driven by a third d6 a custom d6 and four of those sides are the school houses so when you roll a schoolhouse, you turn one corner of the board which rotates things based on the schoolhouse, and that's great that's fine but there's still two sides to that D6. So they decided to add um, help cards and dark dark arts cards. And the help cards are items from the movies or games. They're either spells or allies or items, you know, magical items. Um, okay. And that's, that's fine. You know, it adds a little bit of fun to it. 
And then the Dark Arts cards are bad things which happen to certain groups of players or individual players if you drew the card or if you're in a corridor or whatever. Uh, and so that removes HP. Now, this isn't health points to all the role players out there, uh, okay. but it might as well be. It's, it is in the game theme, house points. So keeping with that Hogwarts, you're, you're, you know, you're playing for your house and you lose house points. But if you run out of house points, you're out of the game. But like the movies, there must be ways to get them, right? Where you do, the, there's a contest or there's a science fair or whatever. I show some of Harry Potter, I know. And then someone <laughs> shows up and is like, House Gryffindor gets 200 points. Like, there's got to be a way to offset this. Like, they have the two decks, right? They balance each other. Un unfortunately, they completely forgot that aspect. So, oh, depending geez. on the number of players you're playing with is how many points you get, how many health points you start with. And in no way is there a way to gain health points. So, in the second... Health, house, house, points. house points. In the <laughs> second game we played, we had a total player elimination within five <laughs> turns okay Done. there's got to be something said for being able to tpk in clue like, I, I, it's probably bad for that game of clue but the fact you can have a game of clue yep. with a tpk i don't know that i find that at least amusing <laughs> and, and the the actually almost the more frustrating point is when you're eliminated you can't go away you have to still sit okay. there because you have your clue cards that you still have to play. You can't do anything in the game, but you still have to reveal clue cards to the other Ouch. living players. So it is not even possible, but likely that it could end up being one person going around the game and everyone else just sitting there waiting for them to ask a question oh to God. show their cards. Uh, I... It's badly broken. Now, thankfully, Board Game Geek to the Rescue, a number of variants have been listed. Um, that allow you to gain points. And that's everyone realizes that gaining points is the solution that, that's missing from this game. Uh, and so we're looking at um, if you gain a health, uh, a health card, you gain points along with that. And that should help balance okay. it out. Because we even tried playing with less players but more house, uh, house points. And we, were, we still had at least one player elimination. And it's just huh. for a kid's game. I mean, it's very clearly a kid's game. It, no one, you don't want them being eliminated before they even get a chance to see if they can make that guess and and see if their logic uh, yeah. is correct. Shocking. Yeah. Like, like <laughs> how how that get through? Like, who puts player elimination in a kids game? Well, I guess that's an old kids game mechanic in a way, but like in Clue, like yeah. it's it, it's I, an I'm, odd. Uh, I was shocked. I was I was shocked. It's, it's you, an odd. Like, I, I was talked about this before. Yeah, I, I was blown away, and and I kept expecting to find something that offset it. And it just yeah. never came. Um, well, even thematically, like that yeah. was a thing as points fluctuated. Yeah, no, it was That's odd. Yeah, it, it was a, a bizarre choice. Um, and and if you fight to try and get as many help cards as possible to stay alive without the point gain, you can't play the. You can't actually make any guesses or get any logic. Yeah, done because I was you're gonna say that. that puts uh, you away from the point of the game yeah right? like the, the, the only way to, 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 to make guesses and deduce not to keep your health house alive yeah because like, the only way the only way to get the help cards is actually in the corridors so going into a room to make the guesses to you know the whole logic aspect you can't get any help cards so if you're in a room and you, you've got to wait for everyone to go around and every wow. turn someone's rolling a dice to to get huh. that dark card yeah it's Jeez. it's interesting but it is a beautiful game. I'll give it that. So as long as you're willing to house rule it and fix it, um, we'll probably keep playing it, just not under the official rules. So that was the end of Clue Harry Potter. Next up, we picked up uh, a simple card game. This was just a quick uh, buy off Amazon called Minecraft Card Game. There is a question mark at the end of the game. It's an interesting one. Uh, it's a simple, quick drafting set building game. Great for three players, ages six and up, no reading. Uh, really comfortable for Minecraft lovers. Uh, I have to call out Mattel here, who are the uh, publishers. For those not aware, um, I'm sure there are many out there, crafting in Minecraft is a simple three by three grid where you place materials in and you get an object or something out of it. You're, craft, you're building a tool. Um, there's only five items to build in the card game and there's only five different materials to work from. Nice and simple. They got it wrong. 
they used the wrong materials in the wrong places. Um, and I mean, my kids immediately, as soon as the cards were being dealt out, called them on it. Uh, it's <laughs> that obvious. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it's bizarre. Um, so, yeah, it's a fun, frivolous game. The kids were over it quickly. They don't, you know, you know hey, that's wrong, but let's play and have the fun. Um, it's it, not hard. It's just disappointing yeah. like like it's Very. it's mattel mattel is owned by hasbro hasbro is a company that puts out dungeons and dragons they oh they have staff that definitely know attention to detail like how, yeah. how do you how do you put out a game where the, it's crafting that's the point of minecraft yeah. the entire emphasis of the game all someone saw it is, is is pixelized graphics that's that's what minecraft is so we put some pixelized graphics on a card and call it minecraft wow yeah. that's disappointing yeah no, i hope it, it, it i hope was. it's made up for it though in other ways it, it, this isn't a clue part two no it's you know it's a fun game it's just a really fun quick Good. easy game for kids to play you're literally just pattern matching and collecting sets the first one to get uh, 20 points based on the sets you've collected wins you know all right yeah so it's not like it's more of a go fish than uno it's a set or gin uh, uh splendor i think is the term I've, i still haven't played splendor but i, I saw people oh, okay. calling it splendor uh Splendor Light on Splendor. Uh, on BGG. I don't know. So when you collect things, they go on a tableau that makes it easier to collect other things. Uh, well, they you can flip them over and they get they have powers or one single use okay. powers once you collect them. Right. Um, yeah, Sounds so that's that. So except that was, for if you're a Minecraft purist, unless you're a Minecraft purist. Uh, but again, easy, easy and fun. And then finally, we got the hobby game for the kids to see if they were actually interested in uh, you know. Seeing what Daddy talks about every week, and <laughs> and what and what some of the more advanced board games are, and uh, actually thanks to the bellhop and uh, your suggestions and uh, tabletop deals, uh, they got Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. Uh, this is again from USAopoly, but this one they got right. Uh, yeah. This is a classic co-op deck builder uh, with an aim for kids and lovers of the books and movies. It looks beautiful. It's designed for kids and well designed for kids, but also adults. Um, and there is a learning and difficulty curve built into the game right into its very packaging. So as soon as you open up the box, um, it's designed to start you off with an easy game and work up from there. Yeah, that's very cool. I, I also bought this for my kids. I haven't played my copy yet. Um, technically, my daughter has, but we'll talk about that next week. Uh, I also bought it. I heard really good things about it. I did hear some initial backlash when it first came out that it was too simple, but to me that meant that's perfect for my kids. I do love the what I've been hearing about the way it ramps up, that it starts off simple and gets more difficult. Yep. Uh, especially, you know, an advanced gamer will sit down and uh, the first thing you do is you open up book one. So it's deck one, and that lays out mm -hmm. a, a selection of cards that you play. You're only playing one villain against one villain at a time. It's, it's heroes versus villains, nice and simple. Um, but that first game is really easy, but for an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old that's never played a hobby game before, it's right. just difficult enough. Um, and again, the theme is really engaging. It's, it's really, um, you know, again, I'm, I'm playing it with my kids and we all love the Harry Potter franchise. So it's really easy to get into that feeling of... I want to cast this spell. I know this spell. Oh, look, this spell just appeared. We haven't seen that before. That's a great spell. Oh, look, there is, you know, this character, that character. And nice. so there's a real level of excitement in playing it. Um, and now my family really got into the binge playing of it. Uh, huh. So we've actually played up to book five twice. Um, wow. and, and at book five, it's tough. Um, you know, again, if I think if it was you and I playing, it would probably be a little a little simpler. But with kids who are are actually trying in some ways to role play it uh, and get the spells that they think, you know, Harry wants to Harry wants to to collect his friends uh, and things. And so because they're doing a little bit of that, you know, we've we've struggled a little bit. And uh, our final play, it came down to one card. We were either going to win uh -huh. or lose with whatever turned over next, and we lost. So. Uh, we have we haven't been able to open up uh, book six yet. Uh, to be honest, that's actually one of the draws of a co-op game, right? Uh, co-op games are almost impossible to balance well, and in general, you should lose more often than you win, or else they're too easy, right. and you're just gonna fire through them. And like that's the draw of Pandemic. Back when I reviewed Pandemic, one of my biggest um, 
discoveries, things I realized about the game, was that it was actually, in my opinion, more fun to lose. Because when you come close and almost win in pandemic, there is an almost undeniable urge to try again. It is the, oh, we're so close. We got to try. We got to do it one more time. We can do this. Whereas when you win, you're like, hey, we won. Okay, I guess we play again, right? Where this has a progression. So there's more of an incentive to keep going. But I always found that I enjoyed my near wins more than my actual wins in pandemic, except for that one at the end of the night after you tried six times and you finally win that seven time where it's just like yay we finally did it right same thing goes back to gloomhaven i explained in gloomhaven that so far the most rewarding experience we had was finally beating a mission we had failed on in the past and had a hard time with so i think that's a key feature for a good co-op game yeah no and i'm really looking forward to it because you know the kids are enjoying it and once you get through it all there are you know it should be really tough and i and i know what some of some of what's coming in in and how to break mm-hmm. it as a game and things. So looking forward to that. Uh, and she games mentions, and I won't I won't give any spoilers, but uh, the characters do age through the game. Oh, cool. So that's a that's a fun little mechanic they've put in, um, and I'm interested to see uh, how that goes. So I'm going to reiterate a question I asked you in person on the weekend, but I think it's important for our listeners to know: Are there spoilers in the game? Do you want to play through it if you haven't read all the books? And and I'm I'm a little torn on this. Uh, there are characters who are going to appear in in the later books that may not have focused and and may may confuse things i'm 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 sort of torn at this point i don't think it's going to be a problem again i've only played through the first five books and within those five books i would say nothing is really going to kill the story for anyone um whether or not that changes in books six and seven I can't say. Again, book seven could be a major change just based on uh, what I know about it. Okay. Good to know. I do have one last note. I do remember reading something because I read the rule book for this one yet, though I haven't played it. There was a suggestion right on the first page that if you were experienced gamers and have played deck builders before, just jump to book three. Yep. So I think that's probably what most gamers, if you're buying this for yourself instead of your kids, because this, well, this is a game for aimed at kids i think adults would enjoy it as far as i've seen Absolutely. but it seems like the the secret is start at book three because book one and two really is uh, probably a little basic for anyone who's played say dominion star realms ascension core worlds or any of the other great deck builders i, I would actually i would actually even probably say book four but that being said okay. to play through books one through three uh if you've got four people who know what they're doing you can burn through those games in no time um, wow, so okay. I, I don't really see any real benefit in, in opening it up and collecting them all through when the time it takes to play those th- first three games is pretty simple. Ah, uh, fair enough, fair enough. Shadzar asks if the Magical Beast type game will come out. There is actually an expansion. I have it. It's the Monster Book of Monsters. Uh, but we aren't going to open that box up until, um, books, until we're done book seven. And then, uh, there is a 2019 expansion or i i'm not actually clear if it's an expansion or a new game but it's going to be hogwarts <laughs> duels and it's two players okay. uh card collecting dueling each other so i'm looking forward to that it's been announced but uh, i don't have any details yet there are a lot of harry potter games like a lot it's crazy we bought some quidditch card game that was so bad i didn't even play it it literally i i bought it i think at zeller's so that goes how long ago it was right. i bought this Man, Harry Potter's been around for a long time. It has. Anyway, it was discount oil at at a toy store for like a buck or two bucks. And it it was like, we we just donated it or put it in Extra Life. I don't even remember. Or threw it out, maybe. I doubt we threw it out. We don't tend to throw out games. Thanks to everyone who subscribes and listens to the podcast who's made that happen. And for others, please take a minute to subscribe to our content on your favorite platform and leave a like, thumbs up, or review so that it's easier for us to find us as well. Now this week, I got a special shout out to Evie Lockhart, who was our 100th subscriber on YouTube. Also, a thanks to everyone else who stepped up because I put out a tweet and I put out things saying, hey, get us to 100 subs for the new year because 100 subs is important. 100 subs is a milestone that unlocks the ability to have a useful URL. So now, instead of a string of random characters and numbers, you can find us at youtube.com slash tabletop bellhop. That's right. Everywhere. If you want to find us, name of the site slash tabletop bellhop should work. 
That is, we've been working to get that done, and it is fantastic that we can now share YouTube that way, and we can say it on air, because I didn't even want to try to pronounce that other one. Nope. The other thing that's going to be good for you guys, it kind of fits in here, is we are working on more YouTube and shinier YouTube content. We've got some plans for the future. I'm not ready to announce anything officially. We're going to vague cast this out, but there's another reason we really wanted that vanity url is because we have big things planned for youtube in 2019 so literally one minute before the show went out tonight i sent out this week's tabletop bellhop weekly this is a weekly newsletter that goes out every wednesday or thursday where i recap everything we did in the last week so you're going to find links to all the content we produced uh podcast episodes blog posts reviews anything else you can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com website where you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. That's right. Just down there on the right-hand side, just a bit down. Uh, Happy New Year's. It is, as of right now, 2019. I got to thank any of you who stopped in during our Gaming Into the New Year live broadcast. Uh, we gained for about 12 hours and we're live for most of it, though we did have a bit of a technical hitch around 2 a.m. It was cool to see some of our fans stop by interacting and asking questions about what we had going on. Our stream got pretty choppy at the end as the network clogged up by all those maintenance activities that everyone schedules for when you're normally asleep. Yes. But it was well past midnight at that point. So we felt viewers had certainly gotten their value from the 700 plus hours of broadcasting. We may do something similar in the future. Uh, I'd love some feedback. I know some of the people in the chat were there. Anything we could do better, anything we could highlight, if the camera position was good. Generally, we just put it out focused on the main game table. I know a couple of times Sean walked it around to kind of show other things that were going on. I I, I'm really happy with how well it worked compared to when we tried to do our launch party. So I, it's good to know the money I have invested on improving my home network and our uh, hardware has helped. Each episode, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or you can head over to the webpage tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Now, social media works too. Uh, we're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, even on YouTube. Well, I prefer if questions come through the website. Yes, it does make it much easier for me to track them and keep track of what I've... Uh, what I have in my Excel spreadsheet, what I don't, what we've answered, what we haven't. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere else. Today on Ask the Bellhop, we have a follow-up question that goes back to episode five, Back to School, where we answered one question from Patreon backer Brian Kurtz about how to teach games. Today's follow-up question is from Sean Hamilton, who asked about teaching gamers a new game versus teaching mundanes a new game. That's always one people have some struggle with. A uh, great follow-up question, Sean. Now, note this is Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, who's here on the podcast. Sean Hamilton is a local gamer here in Windsor, who's part of my regular Monday night group, as well as a regular at our local gaming events. Right, for those new to the podcast, podcast, we've spoken before about the wealth of Sean's that exist in Windsor. It's, Mo collects us. Yes, yeah, so they're like Pokemon to me. I've got to catch them all. Before I get going, I do want to address something quick about Sean's question. Uh, it's the bit about calling non-gamers mundanes. I've never been a fan of this. Uh, the first time I saw a fandom doing this was in the SCA. In the SCA, everyone was a Skadian or a Norm. I think it was Norm. might have been a different term, but it was something like that. Uh, Harry Potter. We talked a lot about Harry Potter this episode. Harry Potter fans like to call people who don't read the books muggles. I don't dig this. I'm not a fan of this at all. To me, it stinks of gatekeeping. Uh, it's it's elitist. It makes it sound like you think that as a gamer, you're better than non-gamers. And I personally say, I'm going to swear, I think that's... I'm sorry, but what games you play or what fandom you follow doesn't make you a better person than someone else. I prefer to stick to the terms experienced gamer and new gamer or non-experienced gamer or less experienced gamer. So I, I struggle with this myself as it can be beneficial from a organizational standpoint, but when taken out of concept, absolutely is problematic. Uh, in the SCA example, for um, technically anyone or anything outside of the SCA is mundane. This isn't a better or worse differentiator, but an actual legal definition within the uh. orders of... Um, and incorporation for the uh, Society for Creative Anachrons uh, Board of Directors. Uh, but it does naturally slip into the vernacular as a derogatory term, which then becomes yeah. hurtful. So it's, it's one of those slippery slopes. 
Yeah, it's the again. I really, I know Sean Hamilton. I know both Sean's. I know lots of Sean's. Sean Hamilton didn't mean anything by this, right? He's using it the way many Skadians use it, where they're just talking about non gamers and it's a way to classify non gamers. I just think it's, it's not a term we should use, especially like just if you can use a better term. Uh, it can be seen as hurtful, it can be seen as gatekeeping. And the sad part is, I also have to say this because I do know people who believe it. I have met that gamer who thinks he's better because he's DM'd, that makes him higher on some totem pole than RPG players who have only played. I, I don't agree with that. Again, the games you play don't make you better than someone else. But anyway, let's let's move on. Now that that's done, um, what we are going to focus on is, is the term experienced, right? I talked about you're going to talk about an experienced gamer versus a less experienced gamer. And it's experience what we need to focus on when we're talking about teaching games and teaching games to different people. So the main thing you need to consider is the person you're teaching's experience with games. Um, how much do they know? What have they played? Are they new gamers who have no... Uh, gaming background, or are they someone who's played a ton of different games and has lots of experience? So what we're going to talk about is how we uh, need to adjust our teaching methods based on new or old players' experience. Now, I'm not going to go into how to teach games. We did that back on episode two. It's one of our more popular episodes, and I think we did a good job on that one. We've gotten enough positive feedback. We're not going to get into the details of how to teach, but rather how to apply the knowledge we put out in episode two and adapt that based on who you're teaching. That's right. Teaching is hard, and there are so many aspects to it. So when we see that our viewers have our teaching episode as our number two all-time download, we're happy yeah. to offer more help and more content related to teaching. So what I'm going to do here is talk about how you need to teak, tweak, uh, tweak that, right? So it's all about the experience of the person being taught. You need to determine their experience first, uh, not only to determine what game you should be teaching, what game you should be playing based on their experience, but how you go about teaching that game. Now, that really branches into two things, uh, picking games, picking what to play. And that is not something I can get in now. That's a whole topic. That's possibly one episode, possibly more. It's not going to fit here. It's something that we may cover. If you are interested in hearing us talk about that, let us know. It's not on our list of questions now. But at this point, we're going to assume you picked a suitable game for the group that you're sitting down about to teach. We're not going to teach you how to, te how to play teach Gloomhaven to grade ones or Yahtzee's to your, Yahtzee to your grandma, unless you ask. We do answer our audience question, after all. Yeah, that would be an interesting. How to teach Gloomhaven to grade one. That, that would be quite the... I, I would think the main way to teach Gloomhaven to grade one would probably be throw out the rules and let them play with the bits in the Gloomhaven box. But who knows? If someone answers, ask the question. Maybe I'll dig deeper into that. So... One of the first things to be aware of when teaching anyone is you need to watch your terminology and jargon. You got to watch which terms you're using. Now I'm not talking about the using uh, offensive and non-offensive terms, so you should be aware of that as well. I'm talking about all of the funky terms we use as tabletop gamers in the gaming hobby. Like together, uh, we created a huge list of mechanics, right? It had, I think when I wrote it, it was under it was like 40 some. And then based on feedback, we kept adding more and we're up to 56 different terms. Now we're looking at deck building, area control, point to point movement, uh, fog of war, all those terms we defined uh, all during a previous episode and on, on the blog. You can find that back on episode nine under the hood. Not only that, right? That's mechanics. That's 56 different game mechanics we came up with as a group. Uh, there's also other special terms, right? Like if you've never played a war game and I use the term chits, you may not know what I'm talking about. And while everyone in the board game industry knows what we were talking about when you say meeple, when you are talking to someone who has only ever played Monopoly, they're going to look at you strange like, what? what's a meeple? You just said a silly word. It sounds like a baby word. And then there's not even those terms, but like the terms that have developed over the years to talk about gaming experiences. So like quarterbacking, which deals with when you have one player trying to tell everyone else what to do, or AP. We talk about AP on the show often. I mentioned earlier in the episode, that means analysis paralysis. Well, a new gamer is not going to know what AP means. They're probably not even going to know what analysis paralysis is. So you've got to watch your jargon. It's one of those things we've struggled with even when we're writing each episode of our show. It's hard to know when you're talking above or below your audience 
especially yes. like we are when we're trying to teach and reach a broad range of players with our message. Yeah, agreed. It's it's definitely like I, I know I do it. I know that I know many of these terms and conditions and things well, and they just slip out. And sometimes we see it in the chat. Someone will ask the question, and that's important. Uh, that's what you need to do. You need to ask the questions. Um, so when you learn someone doesn't have much gaming XP, you need to adjust your vocabulary and be ready to explain these terms. Watch for... Uh, someone looking confused, right? Like, watch for the the someone kind of, you know, making a face when you say something. Obviously, they didn't get it. Um, we all had to learn these at one point, right? Like, I didn't know what a meeple was before I got into board gaming. Roll and move, I can kind of figure out, but I don't necessarily know exactly. But then you talk about area control. What's area control mean, right? Uh, we had to learn these terms. And what's you may not remember is having a whole bunch of these tossed at you at once can be disorienting and discouraging. Don't be afraid to ask questions. And as the teacher, don't be afraid to encourage questions. Uh, don't assume that, uh, that everyone will just figure it out or ask if they don't understand. Um, make sure everyone can know up front that they're allowed to ask. It's better to take a little longer and be clear up front for the teacher and for the learner. To adjust your vocabulary, right? You need to figure out which of these terms are safe to use. And to do that, you need to know uh, the person's gaming experience. And what you have to do is find a commonality, right? A common base. So the first thing I do when I meet a new gamer, I'm going to start with leading questions, right? I'm, I'm going to ask, what's your favorite game? Uh, uh, if they don't necessarily have a favorite game, what, what's your, what was your, what you play growing up? Did you, did you play games with your family? Uh, what's the game? This is a great one. What's the last game you played and enjoyed? The end enjoyed is important. You could also ask, are there any games you really didn't like? You're trying to get the games on the resume. Now, I don't just do this for uh, new gamers. I'll do this with experienced players as well. I'm trying to find a basis of what games they know. Getting some of that player's gaming resume can quickly frame what will come next. Uh, when I only knew about Clue, I'd need to learn a lot of terms I'd likely already know if I'd played just Catan or even Magic. Agreed. So usually I start broad, right? Like I'm going to ask, you know, what games did you enjoy as a, a child or what games did you play growing up? Or, hey, have you gone to any local cons? What did you play there? Uh, once I know a bit, I'm going to start digging into specific games. And what I'm trying to find out here is I'm trying to figure out what mechanics they already know and what terms I can use safely. And what I'm tying it to, though, is the game I'm about to teach, right? Like, I'm not just trying to find out what board games they played. That just sit at a coffee shop, talk about it. I'm trying to find specific information of what mechanics are that in the game I'm about to teach. Do they already know or not know? So I'm trying to get a baseline so I know where to start. So if they play Monopoly, they should know roll and move, economy, trading, and really hopefully auctions if they played by the proper rules. Now, if they haven't played by the proper rules, you can still even talk about the idea of house rules. Yeah. Uh, what did they do for free parking? What do the rules say? And why are there variations and house rules on games? That's uh, jump... it's all part of learning. Fair enough. And jumping back to the, the first topic here, what the, the PSA I started off with, don't judge them based on what games they know. Just a side note, I don't have this in the notes, but like, don't look down on them if all they played is Monopoly. Like, everyone had to start somewhere. So, what you're doing here is you're, again, you're trying to find a baseline. You're trying to figure out what mechanics and mechanisms and styles and themes have they seen and how does it tie in with the game you're about to teach. You're also going to apply this to anyone right this isn't just new gamers i'll do the same thing when i go to the flgs and the guy walks in with a pile of games and i see a bunch of deck builders i'm like oh cool i'm still gonna ask them the same questions hey have you you obviously played deck builders do you you like dominion or have you played like i see your pile there you got all these dominions have you played clank or you, have you seen it with push your luck right i'm gonna Ask the same type of thing, right? Because I'm still trying to find that same basis. Uh, it requires a strong teacher to not only know the different mechanics, but also a lot of different games and how those mechanics yeah. vary between games so that you have the knowledge available to be able to relate Clank and or Dominion to whatever you're bringing to the table. To be, a, to be a good game teacher helps to have played a lot of games. Uh, so, yeah, there's, I guess that's a caveat on this. Where I'm coming from is from someone who teaches games. I'm the game teacher in the group. I'm assuming if 
the, uh, Sean, who asked this question, also has played a lot of games and teaches a lot of people. If you're new to teaching, uh, at that point, you're going to have less of a frame of reference yourself, but you're still going to follow the same things. You're going to use the experience you already have to apply that to the game you're about to teach and use that to teach the game to other people. So it works either way. It, it's a two-sided street that way. The more games you know, the more comparisons you're going to be able to make. So the whole thing you're trying to do is, again, you're trying to get a point of comparison. You are you want to build on what players already know. That's what makes teaching the game easier. Uh, you can use shortcuts because of that. Like, I can teach someone Ascension in minutes, like literally minutes, if they played Star Realms. There is so little to explain if someone's already played Star Realms. The entire teach is basically, hey, it's like Star Realms. It's fantasy. Instead of collecting uh, power and things to shoot each other, you're doing this. And instead of shooting, you're capturing monsters, right? Like, it's pretty simple. Uh, but if I'm sitting down with the same player and I'm about to teach Ascension, and I say, hey, have you played Star Realms? They're like, no, but I have played Dominion. That's going to take more time. Because playing Dominion, it's only one action per card. There's no card combos. Well, there's card combos, but there's no factions where if you play one card of the same faction, whatever. There's more to it. I'm not going to get into the differences between Dominion and Ascension. That would waste way too much of your time. But it's going to take me a lot more time to teach Ascension to someone who's only played Dominion than it is to be someone who only played Star Realms. And then it's going to take way more if I say you haven't played Dominion. Oh, have you played any card games? And they reply, yeah, I've played Hearts it's going to be way more work on my hands. And I'm not saying work in a bad way. I'm just saying I am going to have to define and teach a lot of mechanics for the first time if all they've ever played is hearts. Uh, a slight side note, if you're in a position where the person you're teaching is inexperienced, remember you're teaching them ideas and concepts that every other person, including yourself, is going to have to build off of for later games. Uh, so you're not doing yourself or anyone else any favors if you cut corners. Um Remember, you know, those those basic mechanics are going to come up in game after game. So it behooves you to teach them well. Yeah, exactly. And then we're putting a lot on your shoulders, I guess. But by accepting to teach the game, so you are accepting a chunk of responsibility. So there's two reasons we're doing this. There's two reasons we're trying to find that common base. We're trying to find the foundation to build upon. The first is shortcuts. If I know a player already knows a mechanic, I don't have to explain it. I don't have to teach it. I can focus on other imports of the game, possibly more important parts of the game. For example, the power grid auction system. If I know a game uses the power grid auction system and I know other people at the table know it's the power grid auction system, all I have to do is say, hey, we're about to play Fleet. It's a game about catching fishes. We're going to start off by doing an auction to get these different contracts and it uses the power grid auction system and I can move on to the next thing. And after you do that, we're going to go to the next phase. By saying the power grid auction system, if everyone plays power grid, they know exactly what I mean. So I get to skip that whole part of the teach. Now, if they don't know the power grid auction system, I then have to explain that auction system, which is going to take time. The other thing that's important, besides being able to shortcut it, right, cut down the teach and focus on things they don't know, is people learn by building on the experiences they have. So if you can tie this new game to something they already know, it's going to be easier both for the new gamer to learn and to remember these new rules. While a game maker may not be able to legally say, you tap your card to activate in their rules, you as a teacher can. So if that person knows yeah. magic, that's something that's instantly going to click for them and they're going to know. Uh, you may even get a chance to see that uh, when uh, we release some content later on. Yeah, we're going to find out if Wizards of the Coast uh, is going to try to enforce their copyright of tap when you're doing a teaching video at some point. I highly doubt they can actually enforce that. I'm pretty sure game designers can't, but I'm pretty sure as a teacher you can use it. If you're not releasing it to the public as a video, though, and you're sitting at home with your friends, there's nothing they can do to you. So you're perfectly safe, even though we may not be. So... One of the things that came up last time when we were talking about teaching is the check for understanding. This is very much an HR term. I know I told you before, I used to work in the auto industry and I do the ISO things and I'm used to these terms, right? Check for understanding is the fancy way of saying, did the person learn what I tried to teach them? This is important when teaching games and it's more important with players with little game experiences, which ties back to what Sean said you need to make sure the player is grasping what you're teaching and 
you need to be sure they have that foundation, that they understand the basics. Now, this should still be done with experienced players, but with a new player, you have to make sure they have the base before you move on higher on, right? It's, I know, I, I keep thinking building things, right? You need a strong foundation. Uh, if the player hasn't gotten how new cards are added to a deck when it's shuffled in in a deck builder, when you're three minutes, ten minutes later in the thing and you start talking about using deck depletion strategies, they're not going to get it. They're not going to understand what you mean by thin your deck when they don't even understand how you shuffle. Also, be careful about using terms in multiple ways. Uh, if you talk about burning a card in a game, make sure <laughs> you use that the same way. Uh, the player may nod and smile, and they could be thinking about discarding when you're talking about removing from the game. Uh, and a more comfortable player will you know, quickly pick, pick, pick up on what you've, you've been discussing, but a new a newer player may may get confused by that usage. I got to admit, when you said that, I had this image of a new player pulling out their lighter, so <laughs> which would be a total different, not quite explaining the background. So the whole thing is learning games can be hard. Uh, you are dumping a ton of information on someone. The less experience they have, the more of an info dump this is going to be. It's going to be new terms. It's going to be funky new pieces they've seen before. It could be new shapes of dice. It could be mechanics that persons never dreamed of. Uh, especially for someone new to games, this is all foreign, funky, and weird. People are going to make mistakes and expect that. Expect them to make mistakes. People are going to ask answers that you think have self-evident answers. For example, Sean said, burn the card. The first thing that came to my head was literally burning the card. Maybe this person has only played Monopoly, but has heard about these legacy games where you destroy components and thinks that's a part of Hogwarts battle. I don't know. Uh, you, you have to realize that they don't have the same frame of reference as you do, and it's realizing the differences between those that's important. You're going to politely answer questions. You're going to correct mistakes. And also, don't be afraid to back up. Back up a turn or two. Correct a, and fix a misunderstanding. The other thing is don't expect to finish the game by the playtime on the box, especially with new gamers. Even if every other time you played Azul and only takes you 15 minutes with a new player, allow for half an hour, right? Allow for extra playtime. No one likes to be rushed, and being rushed while learning something is even worse. And learning something new takes time. Absolutely. We can't stress this enough. There are no dumb questions about the topic you're teaching. If you're teaching and they ask why this does this, and you know it's written right there on the card, stop. And think before you answer, it says right there, because they may not understand what's written there because of something they've misunderstood earlier or, or you glossed over quickly. You know, again, think before you uh, you jump on someone who's asking a question. Yeah, uh, especially with the information on the cards, right? Uh, especially thematic games, card games, they like to throw on flavor text. And with a new gamer, you may think the whole thing's flavor text, right? So just because it says it's on the card doesn't necessarily mean they've read it. What I would probably go with in that case is explain it and then say, and to remind you, if you look at your card, it should be on there, right? Which, because uh, actually Magic used to be terrible for that and has gotten better. And I noticed Keyforge was particularly good about explaining every little special term right on the card. So good on uh, Richard Garfield for that one. So your job is to make the game experience welcoming and inviting. No teaching game. So a game where you're teaching new players should feel like a competition. Yes, play to win, but no one's going to walk away with the award. I won my first game play ever. No, just you're sitting down to play the game and realize it's a learning game. Now, here's a big one. I mentioned this on the show before, and people seem very adverse to it, but don't be afraid to start a game over. No one seems to want to do it, but it's a good thing. Like it, it's the, the problem is we as humans have this problem. It's called the lost time fallacy where we think we've invested so much time in it. And if we don't finish it to the end, we've wasted that time. No, it's, it's not a truism. It's a fallacy. Stop now, start over. And it's a great way to teach a game is to play a couple turns, make sure everyone knows what's up. So you're checking in with those note players. You're going back to that check for understanding. You're going, you got it. Do you understand now? Oh, now you get how you, uh, why you'd burn cards or how you shuffle stuff and then go, okay, if everyone's got the game, why don't we wipe the board? Why don't we restart and play for real? Let's do the real game now, now that everyone gets it. There is no reason not to do this. It is a fantastic uh, strategy for teaching games. It's as true for adults as it was when we talked about doing it with kids. Uh, you don't need to finish every game you start. 
you know, there doesn't have to be a winner. Games are supposed to be fun. And if everyone's fumbling and bumbling around as they learn that first few turns, they're going to have more fun if you just stop, reset, and play the game through now that they understand things better, rather than playing the game and getting completely slaughtered because they'd messed yes. around those first few turns and don't stand a chance because of it. Yeah, I agree completely. I, I don't, there's a gamer thing. It's, oh, they say it's a human thing. It's people who watch an entire series on Netflix, even though after the fourth episode, they're like, the show sucks. I, it's, they talk about it all the time on Ludology. It's, it's a psychological thing, but it's something you really should try to get over. They're, they're, if no one's enjoying a game, this isn't even just for teaching. You know what? If a group of your friends sit down to play a game and you're looking around and they're not having fun, offer to quit playing and play something you all enjoy. So that, that's the tabletop bellhop. It's, it's the opposite of the bellhop's law. If you're not enjoying a game, get it off the table. So, Sean, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Personally, I'd take the Lincoln Tunnel, then go up 10th to West 57th. Just... Okay, okay, yeah, okay, smart ass. Uh, no, practice, 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 right? Everyone's heard this joke. Uh, <laughs> not that joke. Well, they probably heard that one, too. Uh, the, everyone's heard it before. Practice does help. Teaching games is a skill, a skill that needs to be learned, and one that improves with practice. The more you teach and the more variety in types of games, as well as, important to this episode, the more variety in types of gamers you teach, the better you will get. Uh, so your FLGS has a game night, almost certainly. Grab a game mm -hmm. or some games and join in. See if people want to learn the games you've bought, brought, but also take time to learn some games you don't know. Experiencing other people teaching you a game is just as valuable as doing the teaching yourself. Yeah, that's actually something that modern gamers have a benefit than I had learning to teach games is there's videos out there now, right? You can watch Rodney Smith. You can watch, uh, oh, I forget his name. I, Gaming Rules, fantastic game teaching videos. Uh, there's Rado, uh, there's Rodney Smith. Rado runs through, there are others. The Geek and Sundry's got a new channel that all they do is teach games. Those are really good for learning how to teach games as well. The one thing I don't like in those shows is something we may be addressing again in the future. So remember the one real difference, the only real difference, not the one real difference, the only real difference between teaching an experienced gamer and someone new to games is their frame of reference, their experience, what they already know that you can use to help teach this new game to them. You want to find a common base to start from and then build upon the experience they already have, no matter how big or small that experience is. You can't teach someone to run until they know how to walk. So now get out there, teach some new games, some new gamers, some new hobby games. Just please don't call them noobs, mundanes, muggles. They're gamers just like you, just gamers with less experience. Help them fix that. So we've had uh, Blood Boiler and Shad Czar and Anshi <laughs> Games going back and forth with me uh, throwing some uh, vague humor in there. I haven't actually been throwing anything useful in there, of course. Uh, we had a four-hour uh, teaching game, a practice game of TI4. Uh, with four Blood hours? Boiler's it group. works, though, right? And then you play it again later. If it's, if it's a tough enough game and that's what it takes, that's what you have to do. Uh, you know, you just... Yeah. If, if people need to learn, they need to learn. And if you all want to play together, then everyone needs to learn. I saw Shadzar say, uh, teach games as if you're talking to a four-year-old. I have to disagree. The, as I just talked about for the last 10, 20 minutes, I think you have to figure out where their experience is. Yes, it's possible the person you're teaching does have the experience as a four-year-old. And then, yes, it is appropriate to talk to them as a four-year-old. But if you find out they're a 42-year-old who's played thousands of different games, you don't want to talk to them like a four-year-old. You're just going to insult them. And both figuring out that spot is is the, the trick, right? Like, that's what we're trying to get across, is you need to find a common ground. You need to find where where what you guys have in common and more importantly what the game you're about to have what you're about to teach you're about to play has in common with what they played in the past the the best teachers out there in uh, in the school system are really the ones who understand how to teach to each student um mm -hmm. it's it's no longer acceptable to stand up at the front at the board reel off a lesson, turn around, go sit at your desk as the kids do homework. Uh, kids don't learn that way. They never have learned that way. Um, there were some horrible education experiences for a lot of people growing up. Uh, and we understand better now that everyone learns in, in different ways and needs to be treated differently. And the good teachers are the ones who know how to learn how that person learns. 
That's another episode two, I think it is, is our teaching app. If you haven't listened to our whole backlog and you are interested in learning how to better teach games, I do recommend going back to listen to episode two. Uh, that basically what Sean just said is what I get into in that one is that there's different ways people learn. And I talk about the ways people learn and then how to use that information to uh, get across game content. Uh, off the top of my head, like I don't remember all, but it, like people learn by reading, by listening, by doing. Um, I I'm missing one at least there. Uh, it is worth listening to, I think. Yeah, our audio quality may not be the best. It might not be the the smoothest episode, uh, but I do recommend checking it out if you do want more information. Because like I said, as for what we're saying tonight, this is more how to modify that, where you're changing your language. It's it's how to do what we were saying in the, different ep the other episode based on who you're teaching, which is not something we addressed the first time. All right, so for more gaming content, including reviews, game, and game night advice, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. Uh, send your questions over on the website under Ask the Bellhop or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Or as I mentioned before, hit us up on social media. That works too. Now, Patreon patrons currently get a bonus. If they're at a good tip or better level, which is two bucks a month, we will bump your question to the top of the list. We are... This year, we are dedicated. Anchi Games and I are going to redo the Patreon backer levels. It's on our list to do. We're hoping to get it done in January, early this year. We've got some exciting new stuff that I hope will incentivize you to support the show. Speaking of our Patreon, a shout out and a thank you to our backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Uh, Misdirected Mark, join Chris, Phil, and Bob every Tuesday night at 8.40 Eastern as they talk games and games mastering. Though so maybe I gotta edit this, because the last few months they've been all over the place. They broadcasted <laughs> on uh, New Year's Eve this week and didn't broadcast last night. But in general, just go to twitch.com forward slash chrismmp and try to figure out their schedule. It's a fantastic show. I would even more so recommend grabbing their podcast and getting it once a week. Great show. One of my best and one of the inspirations for this show. Brian Kurtz. was glad to hear from you on New Year's Eve. Yeah, it was awesome. You stopped in. I know I was in the middle of a game. Duran Barnett. Thank you. Uh, Joe Swick. Thanks. Steve D. Thanks for your support. Didn't see you in the chat tonight. I hope you're doing okay. Jesus. Thanks very much. And William Fisher. Thank you. Well, that sounded like a double bell to me, which means my shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to help support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here live every Wednesday night, 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Live to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thanks for joining us. We'd like you to invite you to hang around and join us in the Pento Suite for an off-the-books after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on. <laughs>